identification. Now, the question that we received uh, was, and it's been raised at various times over the years, but uh, it seems to have popped its head up. Everybody's talking about, you know, getting identification for, of your clients. Now, it is a requirement under legislation for New South Wales agents to get uh, identification. So photo identification, other forms, secondary identification, a couple of forms there, um, proof of ownership of the property if it's a vendor or a landlord. Uh, if you're a buyer's agent and you're, and you're working with a buyer, then yes, if you're entering into any type of agency agreement, you need to get the full fraud prevention identification checklist completed. So that's the legis legislative requirement. The question we had was around whether when you've just sold a property and you're filling in your sales advice and you're getting excited now because you've got an exchange and, and off we go, here we, you know, we're, on, we're on the last bit of the race now in terms of selling that property when you're a listing agent, uh, do you get vendor identification to send through with the sales advice? Now, there's no legislative requirement to do that. However, let's look at the realities of this. Let's look at some best practice. You're sending through uh, a sales advice. You need to know who your, who your purchases are, for starters. Let's make sure you spell, it, spell their names correctly. So have a look at their, their driver's licenses while you're there. Make sure you get the full names, the full spelling, so there can be no questions down the track. If you've just done an auction campaign and you're signing and you're filling in this uh, document at auction, you know, there's lots going on and there's probably underbidders wanting to chat to you and other people wanting, you know, and a whole range of, you know, it's busy. Whether you've been, done an on-site or an in-rooms auction, it's, it's a busy, frantic time. You've got happy vendors, happy purchases, fingers crossed on those both those levels. And, you know, it, it's, it's, you're under pressure to get this right. The easiest way to get the spelling right is ask for their photo ID. Yes, they've registered, but only one might have registered. The other one might not have if it's going in two names. They might be wanting to put it into a company name. Oh, my goodness, okay, now I need to know who the directors of the company are. So there's a whole range of issues here that you need to think about to make sure that you're getting this right. So not legislatively required, but certainly really good practice. And you don't need to fill in a form for it. You don't need to keep it in your file, but you do need to know who your vendors are, make sure you get their names right, make sure that you're writing on the contract the actual entity that is purchasing it, whether it's a company, a trust, a, you know, and who are, the, who are the directors of that company. And if it's individuals, getting their full names on there. So it makes it easier for that process to go through. Yes, it is the solicitor's job to, to sort that out down the pathway. but And they, they obviously, both sets of solicitors need to identify their clients uh, in, in certain ways. Not your deal. But best practice, yeah, have a, have a look at some identification to make sure that you've got the right person that you're signing uh, for the exchange of the contract. So there's, there's my statement on that one. So uh, best practice can often save you just as much as any legislation will save you in terms of how it's protecting the process to making sure that everybody is being treated fairly and equally on the way through. So uh, hopefully that, that helps and that answers a couple of questions that we've had about that issue.